hoch und dank sei dem Herrn. Praise the Lord. Wir haben sicher alle We have certainly all listened to what was sung and perhaps thought about thinking on 1 Corinthians 13 and some scriptures. But if we go back to the origin of divine love, then we cannot start at Pentecost, but at Golgotha. For God so loved the world on Golgotha through the redemption the love of God was manifested. And at Pentecost, God poured out the same love into the redeemed through His Spirit. The one belongs to the other. They cannot be separated from each other. Anyone who has experienced the redeeming love of our Lord must experience that both Calvary and Pentecost are revealed together in your life and mine. There is no other way. It remains a theory, and we know that there are enough people, but today we don't want to look at others. Today we want to put ourselves in front of God's mirror and ask, where do I stand? How does God see me? And I say once again, God's love for us was revealed on Calvary. But at Pentecost, the same love of God was poured out into the believers through the Holy Spirit, so that they too could move forward in faith with divine power, so that divine life would come into them. And I think that is our desire, our longing in these days, not just to hear about things, but to experience them, to become a part of what God has done. Two things struck me. One is from Isaiah 52, verse 6, which is part of everything. Here it says, Therefore my people shall know my name. Therefore they shall know in that day that I am He that does speak. Behold, it is I. And then comes the verse, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publishes peace. Only the one who has found peace with God can carry this peace forward. Only those who have been forgiven can bring this forgiveness to others. And only those who have accepted the love of God into their hearts can bring the great offer of grace to others in this divine love. If this is not the case, then all of being a believer becomes a Pharisaism, and we can go into the temple of God and say, Lord, I thank you that I am not like this one or that one. 
And then it would be better if we had saved ourselves the petrol costs and stayed at home. But when we come to appear before God, we do so in humility, in reverence before Almighty God, who is absolutely holy. We then bow down in the dust and say, Lord, who are we that you have looked upon us with favor? Every time we have sung the song, Who will pass through the pearly gates as the victor? It has always gone through my heart and soul. It was always a question, will it be me, will it be you? Not a question that comes from doubt, but to be strengthened again and again, to receive certainty from God that we are still on the right path, that God is still with us, that He is still speaking to us, that His Spirit, His Word, His blood is still working on us, and that we are not going our own way, on which we cannot reach the goal, but that we are walking on the ways of God and that we do not take our own words as our guideline, but the Word of God, the revealed Word, we know and make no secret of the fact that everyone has the Bible at home, all churches, denominations and fellowships, But God has spoken once again at the end of days, has made the written word into the spoken word anew, has summarized everything. And today the question is no longer, brother, what do you think about this? Or what does he think about it? Today we know that God has spoken and that He has summarized everything and communicated it to His people in a binding way. Blessed are those who can grasp this and believe it. He spoke to the prophet Daniel back then in chapter 12, verse 4, close up these words and seal the book even to the time of the end. Many have searched, but the time had not yet come. Now it is here. It is the most glorious time in which people have lived on earth and also probably the most critical time there has been, because the two are so close together. But since we have been singing about the love of God, allow me to make this comment. Anyone who carries the love of God in their heart will not enforce harshness against others. Something of the love of God will have to penetrate. It is impossible for us to carry it within us without it being revealed through us. In our doing, even in our judgment, in our words, in all our actions, what we really are is revealed. Words then no longer count at all. You can often say, I love God, and it doesn't have to be like that. If it is so, then we love each other, and love does no harm to our neighbor. This is also a part 
a saying of the Holy Scriptures, and so there are characteristics of divine love, characteristics that we must have. In order to be fully transformed into the image of the Lord, but tonight we wanted to continue with what we started on Wednesday evening. We talked about the church, about the spiritual build-up, and we come here to come closer to God. To come closer to each other, we come here to understand God better, and also to understand each other better. That always goes hand in hand. Nobody can tell me that they are close to God and distant from a brother. That is impossible. Whoever is close to God is close to his people. Those who love God love those who are born of God. That is what the Scripture says, and so there are always opportunities for testing, where all self-deception can be eliminated if we apply the standard of the Word, not to others. That is always a simple thing, but then we still don't know where we stand. Only when we apply this standard to ourselves do we realize how we are doing. Brother Brenham probably said at one place in his sermon, even if we disagree with someone, I opened it in a hurry just now. It is the sermon, God's gifts always find their place. Of the 22nd of December, 1963, I had a quick look at some of the most powerful sermons were preached in 1963 and we do well to read them and take them to heart. Here it is said, even if we can disagree with a person, why can't we do it in a brotherly way? Only true brothers can act in a brotherly way. And if a brother sees something differently to the other brother, then as a brother he must not lose his brotherly manner. He must keep it. Because he is a brother in Christ, he must maintain respect for the other brother in Christ. If he does not do this, he is violating the commandment of divine love. It goes on to say, See, if Christ is in the heart, then it doesn't matter how much you disagree with this person. Yes, we would say, if you agree with a person, then it doesn't matter. Then everything is glorious and joyful. But that's how it is everywhere. And the Lord says, If you love those who love you, what do you differently from the Gentiles, who also love one another? But the point is to put the love of God above all else. If things don't go our way, and we have already come so far that it is no longer about our direction, but about the divine direction. But if there is a brother who has not yet been attuned to this divine cause, then you will not attune him. 
At best, you will only upset him even more. That's all we as humans can achieve. We are told here, see if Christ is in your heart. That's the point. If Christ is in the heart, but if he is not in the heart, then that plays a very big role. If he is in the heart, then it doesn't matter at all. If he is not in the heart, then it plays a very big role. A Paul, who was filled with the Spirit of God, in whose heart Christ had taken dwelling through faith, he was able to write to the Philippians, If any of you is of a different opinion, let God reveal it to you. This is the mind of Jesus Christ. Not that we should teach one another with power, but that we should all be taught of God with loving kindness. It goes on to say, I often disagree with many people, yet I have never seen anyone with whom I disagreed, whom I did not hold in higher esteem, put my arms around him and call him my brother trying to help him as best I could. We can only help each other if God has helped us. And if God has helped us, then we can put ourselves in the position of the person concerned and also recognize why he does not yet see as perhaps should be seen why he does not yet understand as should be understood. And in divine love, we place our hand on his shoulder, not in hypocrisy, not in looking down on the person concerned, but in divine humility, realizing that it is only grace that God has spoken to us and that we have understood His words and that it means more to us than all the interpretations that have been given to date. It's all grace. And I think that the person in question, and I believe that I can say that here today with a sincere heart, because the proof has been given all over the world. And I have, and you all know this, it doesn't need to be emphasized. I sometimes had to speak to large crowds in very critical situations. And when a man writes, who was present in a meeting with more than 10,000 people, Brother Frank, we cannot forget the word you have brought, not I and not all those who have heard it. And this man prayed with a whole congregation the statement of faith. And you all know how that can make you feel. And I spoke to him about it, but not in a critical way, but in divine love. In divine love. And he explained to me why he was doing it. And I said, now I understand. I didn't see now I see that it's right, but now I understand. You have to be able to put yourself in someone else's shoes. And he said, all the churches in this country do it, including the Pentecostal churches. I said afterwards, now I understand. But I didn't say it was right. 
You have to have the love of God in your heart and be able to overlook many things until the time and hour of God has come for these people. And then they will receive the word of the Lord and put everything else aside. Here are a few words. If Christ is in my heart, if I really love the person concerned, I esteem him higher than myself. This is only possible for those who are truly great before God. All those who are richly blessed by God can esteem others higher than themselves. And those who have great difficulty are, of course, those who want to be something. But we really don't want to be one of them. It says here, I may not agree with him because I don't believe the same things as he does, and so on. But then I can explain my point of view to him, and he can explain his to me. Then we put it together and see what comes out of it. When we have a disagreement like this, it should never get to the point where we get angry and want to hurt or even destroy each other or anything like that. We should always try to build up. It is about building up the church of the living God. And this building up, perhaps I will show it to you, this building up happens in the love of God. There is no other way. Everything happens in the love of God. Redemption, everything up to the perfection happens in the love of God. It should be in Ephesians. Ephesians, it's in some places. Here, Ephesians 4, if you want to look it up. Ephesians 4, verse 16. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. There is no other way to edify the body of Jesus Christ than by edifying in the love of God, not with regulations, not with laws, not with harshness, but in divine love. And here we have heard it. It says, with such disagreement, it should never come to the point of getting angry. And how far does it get among believers? They are divided. There is such an irreconcilability that is unthinkable among unbelievers an enmity that has not been seen since the Garden of Eden is revealed. And then, hallelujah, hallelujah. No, not like that. Believe me, that's not how it works with God. And when people experience all this in themselves and think about it, and have not absolutely lost their connection to God and died spiritually, they must realize that they cannot stand their ground before God like this. 
It is even said here, it should never come to the point where we become angry and hurt one another, that we hurt or destroy. And how far has it come that we hurt, injure and destroy one another, that we are unforgiving to the point of no return. Have we listened to the sermons in vain? Have we heard God's word in vain all these years? Or will the Spirit of God still have an overcoming multitude in the end, a redeemed multitude that will have become one heart and one soul? A multitude that has received the Word of God as their testimony. This is very important because in Revelation 12 it is written, These have overcome him, the devil, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. The Word of God must have become our testimony so that the blood of the Lamb can complete the work of redemption in all the redeemed. Let us take such sayings to heart, for surely they have been inspired by the Spirit of God to love where hatred is revealed, to remain silent where there is a storm. Yes, you think wind force 12 has broken out to keep peace because you have it in your heart without effort. Do you think we need to make an effort Didn't Brother Brenham talk about the lamb and the dove? Must the sheep make efforts to bring forth wool? Does it have to worry about whether something will come or not? A goat may spend its whole life worrying about wool, but not a sheep. A sheep is a sheep by nature. Both have fur, but they are very different. If we are lambs of God, sheep of His pasture, then no effort is required. Then we are not only tame on Sunday, but also on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And don't think that Friday is then free. Friday is not a day off, but also a day that belongs to it. And on it, we are just like on the Sabbath. That's just the way it is. That is the divine state in your life and in mine. And that is where God wants to bring us, to rest in God, peace with God. Blessed are the feet that proclaim peace. Yes, what then of the hearts and souls of those who proclaim the peace of God, which is higher than all understanding that comes into us? If the feet of those who preach peace and salvation are already blessed, then what about the people who experience the salvation and peace of God that has been preached? Yes, then they are also blessed, aren't they? Yes or no? I mean, we are here among ourselves tonight. The feet of those who preached peace have already been blessed. What about the hearts? 
And who were and who are these men? Men of God who proclaim the message of salvation, who have good things to say, and those who speak of God and salvation have no time to say anything else. They are completely absorbed in the divine, and so are all those who hear it. It says here, we should always be trying to build up. And we already spoke on Wednesday evening about the fact that in the end, and we believe this with all our hearts, that God will have a church without spot or wrinkle, a church that walks before Him as cleansed and before Him as sanctified, a church in which He can reveal Himself, a church that is here on earth to praise His name through which he can bring his work to completion. And God has placed and set various ministries in this church. And not only that, but the revelation of the Spirit is given to each individual in this church not just two or three have a share in it, but everyone. Paul writes to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 12, here it says, Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. Then comes the list of the things that God does through the Spirit and through the Church. Before all this can happen, we must, and I firmly believe, we will experience an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And I believe also in this, the sermon about the Church helps us. I also opened it earlier, that we should learn from everything and never lose heart, but that God teaches us through all the experiences we have had that he wanted to give us instruction, that he wanted to help us so that we can stand our ground before him. Here, in this sermon, we are told, Paul did not have to write once to the church in Ephesus, to the one in Rome, or to any other church, about how they should operate their gifts of the Spirit properly. But to the Corinthians, he had to talk about it constantly, because for them, it was the order of the day. It's really strange sometimes when something breaks in a church, it seems to never end. But at some point, God puts an end to everything and establishes and implements His divine order with those who are of good will. 
It must be possible in these last days to look away from everything that may have happened and look to the Lord, to learn lessons for all the future and to make ourselves available to the Lord. We briefly mentioned the use of the gifts of the Spirit on Wednesday. Perhaps it is even right that the teaching on this is given before the Spirit is poured out and the gifts are operated, because in the meantime some damage could have already been done. In order to prevent this in advance, we should receive the instruction so that we know later what should be done. And it is actually the same in every profession. Every profession has a training period and then you become self-reliant and can carry out the work. The Lord gives us the instruction here. Brother Burnham says he would like to say the following, as Paul did back then. When you come together and someone speaks in tongues, let someone else interpret. But if there is no interpreter, let him keep silent. It is different if there is an interpreter. This is something, and may God help me. I almost said I was convinced of it all my life. I have taught that the same person should not do both. If the same person does both, namely operating the gift of tongues on the one hand and the gift of interpretation on the other, then there is a danger that this person will give in to their own thoughts. And that is not what God wants, as Paul writes to the Corinthians. If there is no interpreter, let those in the church keep silent and pray to God for themselves. So, when it comes to the point that the Spirit is poured out and gifts are in operation, then one should speak in tongues by the Spirit, and when he has spoken, stop and wait for God to use another to give the interpretation. This is biblical and not otherwise, for otherwise it would not be written, if there is no interpreter, let the person concerned keep silent in the church. But he who has the gift of speaking in tongues should pray that it may be interpreted. This is also very necessary, but it should be done as God has commanded. It goes on to say, I have watched the church here. I have seen you grow up, and I have seen many gifts of the Spirit in operation among you. So one time I had to go to Brother Neville with a word from the Lord and correct him on something he was doing. I think I mentioned that here on Wednesday night. And you know, the secret is whether someone is preaching, whether someone is saying something, or is operating a gift, if it is the Spirit of God that we have, then we will always let ourselves be corrected. If it's not the Spirit of God, then we'll fly off the handle. Then somehow all the seams burst and people fall apart. Where God is, we have no responsibility at all. Imagine I bring you a message. And it's not me speaking, but the Lord then you don't have to deal with me, but with a message I have brought. 
then you are not judging me, but the word that was preached. I don't feel addressed at all. Nobody can want anything from me, because I am not up for debate. Either God's word is up for debate, and there are questions and corresponding answers, or we are dealing with people and the words of people. It is the same with the operating of the gifts of the Spirit. If someone operates a gift of the Spirit, and it has happened who knows how often, that the person concerned can give way to his own spirit, you only have to read Ezekiel 13 or many other passages in the Holy Scriptures, New and Old Testament, that people remain people. And we see that even Brother Brenham had to correct himself at least once, we know that for a fact, after the opening of the seals, about the first seal, he couldn't get upset and say, I said what I said, that's it. The time had come, the Spirit of God had revealed more, and he set the record straight. Now, if such a man, a prophet, and you can safely say that, from birth, for so the Scripture teaches, prophets do not become prophets when they grow old and gray. Prophets are prophets. I read it to you, so that you know that it is written. Otherwise, someone might think, wait a minute, what you are saying is not right. I read from the prophet Jeremiah, Chapter 1, verse 5. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. That is a divine decision, and God does not make his decision once we have seen the light of day. God made his decision before Adam saw the light of day. Is that so or not? And these divine decisions must be respected. And that is why we are simply of good faith, and not only that, but full of confidence, and know that God has his way with his people and that we have received in these last days the early reign of teaching. And I hope that we can come to an end with the early reign of teaching, so that the latter reign, which brings with it the realization of all the promises, can take place through the Church. For this is what it is given for, that the sown seed may come forth, ripen, and that a harvest may be brought in. During the time of sowing, the rain is pleasant, but no one can reap. A time passes, and then comes the time when the rain falls before it ripens. But, let me say it again, we must finish teaching before the latter rain falls. If God has not succeeded in teaching us thoroughly in this preparation time and making us obedient and submissive to His Word, then the horses will run away with us again. And then, what did it all come down to? Then we will end up where all spiritual movements have ended up so far, by becoming organizations. And that must not and will not happen. From this final revival, the Lord 
will bring forth a bright church that will be transformed into the image of the Lord, into His nature, but which will have become full of the Spirit, partakers of the divine nature, filled with the love of God. By this, all will know that we are His disciples if we have love for one another. If we look a little further at this verse spoken by our Lord and perhaps write it a little further, then it means all who cannot love one another as God has loved them have hardly a right to call themselves His disciples. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, saith our Lord. We can be disciples of Brother Brenham. We can be disciples of Brother Frank. We can be disciples of any brother. John also had disciples, as written in the Bible. Disciple means pupil, follower. Someone who is taught something somewhere is a disciple, so to speak. I would be ashamed on the day of the Lord's return if even one person who has sat under the sound of the proclamation only out of enthusiasm before a divine calling and has not become a disciple of Jesus. I want everyone to become disciples of Jesus. His disciples, not mine. What do I have to teach or say to you in any way? Nothing at all. I sit in a row of chairs just like you and listen to the word of the Lord in the same way. Let us be disciples of the Lord. And if we are, we have love for one another. And then say to him, Oh, if you only knew, yes, if you knew what God has done for you, you would forget what others have not done for you. Let's read on. We find exactly the same thing with gifts today. This is the reason why God cannot entrust gifts of the Spirit to too many people. They don't know how to handle them. That's why we don't have more of them today. Then we also realize that there are many imitations of the gifts of the Spirit. But I don't think that's the case here in our church. I am grateful for that. I don't think there are imitations here. I think we have real gifts, but we need to know how to use those gifts. If you want to do something right, it's like working for a boss. Just like when you started at your first job, you were willing to follow orders. As a result, the boss gained trust in you and will continue to promote you. I believe that now is the time for the tabernacle to learn how to use the gifts God gives us so that he can entrust us with even greater things than what we already have. But we cannot move forward if we are like a person who has to be told everything over and over again. Remember that. And the spirit of prophecy is subject to the prophets. That's what the scripture says. If you come across a man or a woman that you need to correct and the person gets upset, even though you present the scriptural truth, it shows 
that the spirit that is on them is not of God. For the Bible says that the spirit of the prophets, or of prophesying, also of witnessing, preaching, speaking in tongues, and so forth, and the interpretation of a tongue is like a prophecy, all of that are subject to the prophets, and the word is the prophet. We realize that it is not okay for a man or a woman to jump up and give a message while the preacher is standing on the platform, no matter how much they would like to do it. I don't know how much further we can get with this today, but tomorrow morning, with God's help, based upon these statements here, we will bring it into the divine order. And I say once again, it would be very nice if we could all get an obedient heart, a willing spirit, bow before the Lord and say, My God, for so many years you have spoken to us in a fatherly and gracious way. You have preserved us. You have brought us this far. Now, as adults, as mature children of God, as those who have come unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, we want to receive things from you that we have not yet received. Lord, trust us now. We have understood your teaching. From now on, we will follow your instructions. You can rely on us. If that is the case, then I would like to use the same word. Then you can rely on God that He will bless us mightily. Do you think the Lord is interested in a powerless church? Should His name be honored and His word confirmed by such a church in which he cannot bear witness to himself as the living one? Never ever. God had the pattern of the New Testament church written down from the early church, from the time of the apostles, and we have to measure ourselves against it, and we have to be honest enough to say, Lord, we are not like that yet. And then we say in faith, in a little while, by your grace, we will be like that. This may seem strange to some, but I believe with all my heart that the Lord will have a church in the end, called out, cleansed, sanctified, prepared for the ministry that is to be carried out as one heart and one soul with divine love for one another towards each other that it can be absolutely revealed that we are true disciples of Jesus, because we have love for one another. And the love never ends. Everything may cease. Everything human, even the gifts of the Spirit, that's how it says in 1 Corinthians 13, they will cease. But love will never cease. And in chapter 14, verse 1, it says, Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. God wants all this, but in His order, under the leadership and inspiration of the Holy Spirit, only where God Himself is at work, can the church of the Lord be built up?
And I want to be part of this spiritual build-up by grace. I want to be part of it when the Lord reveals Himself. I want to be there when He speaks, when He corrects, when He rebukes. I want to be there when He pours out His Spirit. I want to be there when He works, when He blesses. And I want to be there when He returns to take His own home. I want to be there when the marriage supper takes place. I always want to be there when the Lord does something. There should be no gap. By grace, only by grace, we will be there. And finally, let me say, with whom God will finish His work, with those who have come to the end of their own work, Anyone who continues in their own way, with him God will not be able to continue. It will not be possible to mix the divine and the human, just as human interpretations of the word cannot be mixed and combined with the word itself. It will not be possible to mix and combine what people do and what God does. What God does is much higher than what we are able to do. But God will still use people and imagine He wants to use you and me. And I don't hope that anyone is sitting here thinking to themselves, well, maybe God will choose a few and then it will work out. God will not choose a few. God will choose you, namely each individual, as we have read, to him the revelation of the Spirit will be granted. And then we may look at ourselves and say, Lord, how will it be? And then nothing will happen. And when we look to the Lord, we say, Be it unto me according to thy word. That's the whole secret. First Mary said, I know of no man. How shall these things be? And then when she realized, Holy Spirit will come upon you. She said, Be it unto me according to thy word. Blessed is she that believed. Here we have it. Looking at ourselves, how shall it be? And then we hear the divine answer and reply, Lord, be it unto me as you have said. Be it unto me according to thy word. That's how the promise was fulfilled on Christ. And that's how it will be fulfilled with and on and through the Church. Tonight, we speak to our God in faith. Be it unto me according to thy word. Do in me as you have promised. Fulfill your work in all of us. And let the love that was revealed on Calvary and poured out at Pentecost enter our hearts through the Holy Spirit. And already God has come into His own and will bless us from the riches of His grace. Praise and glory be unto His name. Amen. Let us stand up and pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, faithful God, that we have to do with you, with your word, with your truthfulness, with the promises you have made 
God's promises remain. They do not waver eternally. Jesus has sealed with his own blood what he promised in his word, as this hymn goes. Faithful Lord, you have given the promises to your people, to your blood-bought multitude. As such, we stand here tonight before your holy face. Thank you for the glorious message, for the restoration, for the rebuke, for the instruction, for the introduction. Hallelujah. Praise and honor, glory and worship be to you, faithful Lord. Bring the teaching to completion yourself and grant us grace that we may understand every lesson, that we may have grasped it in our innermost being and not forget it again, but keep it and at the time when it is required that it is there so that everything may proceed in your will under the leadership of your Spirit. Faithful Lord, you have strengthened me in my faith. I thank you for that. O oh God, how much trouble you take with us. Faithful Lord, who are we? Dust and ashes. And yet, you have put divine life into us. Lord, together we ask you for the outpouring of thy Holy Spirit and thank you also together that you give it to us for you have promised it. Hallelujah. Praise and honor be to you. It is you who give early and latter rain at the right time. It is you who gives instruction. You are the one who allows the time to come when instruction is applied, and we may do what you have appointed us to do as co-workers in the kingdom of God. Faithful Lord, you are the head, we are the members. Take us and bless us, each one of us. We also pray for all those who are not here today. Faithful God, you know your own. Lord, guide them, lead them. Beloved Savior, lay claim on them. Lord, it is a glorious day, a year of jubilee, not a year of 365 days, but a time of grace, as you proclaimed in Luke 4. This is the acceptable year, hallelujah, the day of salvation, of grace. We thank you for it. Faithful God, I ask you to take from us all fanaticism, all misunderstanding, all self-will, but give us faith in our hearts to place ourselves at your disposal, that we say, yes, take us, Lord, just as we are, and work through your word, through your blood, and through your spirit in all of us for the praise and glory of thy holy name. You do it. I thank you for it. Hallelujah. Praise, honor, and glory be to your holy name. Amen. Thank you. 